seat of power was Paris. The royal residence was the Palace of the Louvre. The nobles had their homes close by, which meant they could attend on the king and still enjoy salon society in the capital. And vive la différence! But Louis was passionate about outdoor pursuits. He really enjoyed country life. He began to spend more and more time at Versailles. Louis expected his courtiers to join him. But not everybody wanted to travel out into the sticks. We really are out in the wilds here. Events are poor, it's non-existent. The sooner we return to Paris, the better. And even after the dukes and duchesses, the counts and marquises had made it out to Versailles, there was nowhere decent for them to stay. According to Madame de Sévigné, after one visit to Versailles, the courtiers were in a fury because they said the king didn't take care of any of them and there was scarcely a hole to take shelter in. But the courtiers came up with a new witticism, a bon mot. Versailles, they said, is a mistress without merit. But the modest hunting lodge was about to have a makeover. When I hosted a party here a few years ago, we did not have the room to accommodate my friends. Most of them had to take rooms in town. So I'm building some myself. 400 apartments, all told. Louis incorporated this hunting lodge into his plans, and it's still there, right at the heart of the later building. Louis added additions that are still known as the envelope, literally enveloping the original building. And sleeping a cosy 15 or so extra guests, this first phase of construction provided room at Versailles for 600 of Louis's closest friends. And that was just the start. But Louis didn't build Versailles to be nice to his chums. He did it for the survival of the monarchy. You might be forgiven for wondering why Louis XIV would go to such lengths to keep his throne safe. As a royal historian, it's hard to think of another ruler who comes across as so supremely confident. Louis inherited from his mother a passionate belief in the divine right of kings. The idea that kings were like little mini-gods who ruled on earth. In case anyone had missed the point, at Louis's birth he was given the name of Dieu Donné, given by God. This is because, miraculously, he was his parents' first surviving child after 23 years of marriage. A gift from God indeed. Louis took these ideas very much to heart. Louis' self-glorification knew no bounds. He had himself painted in the guise of Roman emperors. As Alexander the Great, even as the omnipotent Greek god Zeus. No hero was too glorious, no god too mighty to escape the comparison. And Louis took as his personal emblem a symbol he thought fitting for his dazzling godlike status. The sun. The sun is the center. The heart, the mother of the universe. Without its warmth and light, all life is gone. Man will cease to exist. One could almost believe he was talking about you. Louis was a master of propaganda. But don't let all this grandstanding deceive you. In some ways, it was a sign of weakness. If he had been absolutely powerful and totally secure on his throne, then he needn't have bothered. Louis had learned that being king was a dangerous business. Are you scared? Of course you are. If history teaches us one thing, it is this. Terrible things happen to kings. Louis's greatest fears were founded in the deep divisions within the country he inherited. In the 17th century, France wasn't by any means the unified nation we know today. Different regions had different laws, customs, even different languages. And vast parts of the country were controlled not directly by the king, but by great noblemen. The north and east. Who defies me there? The Duke of Cassel, sire, to my mind. Commands great influence. Half the nobility are in his debt. His family have occupied those lands since before memory. These nobles had huge independent powers in the regions they dominated. They didn't even have to pay the king's taxes. So the king was locked in a deadly power struggle, constantly competing with the nobles. Louis knew only too well how vulnerable he was. 
and he'd known it pretty much since the day he was born. During Louis's childhood, the monarchy had tried to wrest control from the nobles. The result was a bitter civil war. In 1651, while Louis was staying in Paris, a riot erupted. The violence came a little too close to home. The mob broke into the palace and demanded to see the young king. They marched into his bedroom, where Louis pretended to be asleep. The royal family managed to escape, but Louis was traumatised. The incident had a profound effect on Louis. From that moment on, he saw Paris as a crucible of danger where the people and the nobles could plot against him. Never again would he let chaos and violence threaten his very being. For Louis, the safest place from which to rule was not Paris, but Versailles. We must lay our own foundation here. Why here, sir? Because I will not be the king of Paris. I know who I am. I am Louis XIV. I am king of France. To prove who was in charge, Louis made himself an absolute monarch. He declared he was the sole ruler of France and set about reining in the power of the nobles. This is your king's new law, stripping away the dignity of a true noble, defiling the reputation of a man whose family forms the bedrock of this country. Now once, not long ago, we knew where we stood. But now we must prove ourselves. Now we must sing for our suppers. Now the king says, I am France. But I say, it is we who are France. In this battle, Louis had some subtle new tactics in his armory. Louis' solution to the problem of his nobles shows just how good he was at wielding what you might call soft power. He watched and learned from the mistakes of other kings, like Charles I of England, for example. He had taken up arms to defend his royal prerogative, and look what happened to him. But Louis wanted to wage war with refinement. He planned to devastate his enemies with his hospitality. He was going to overwhelm them with fancy titles that didn't necessarily mean anything. And above all, he intended to emasculate them by making them do trivial jobs in his household, here at his new country home of Versailles. It's no bigger than a broom cupboard. As a matter of fact, I believe it was a broom cupboard. Welcome to Versailles. Louis loved to play the host. He kept his courtiers busy with gambling, feasting, hunting, and to top it all, fabulous parties. Louis made sure his dazzling hospitality would always be remembered. Let's have a look at our massive book of pictures of one of Louis's parties. And here is Versailles looking extremely splendid. These specific drawings were of an entertainment called The Pleasures of the Enchanted Island. That's a very alluring name, isn't it? It, it is, although after six whole days and six whole nights, I'm not sure how allured anyone would have <laughs> felt. It was an epic party based on an epic poem, The Frenzy of Orlando. The lead role was Roger. Could it be possible that Roger himself was played by the king? I think you might have spotted Louis's role as he chose for himself here, right in the middle, on his magnificently rearing horse, is Roger. <laughs> I wonder who is in charge of casting. <laughs> Louis was a natural showman. He had a reputation as a fine dancer. and he never missed an opportunity to display his talents. But here, the real star of the show was Versailles. Oh, look at this. This is the marble courtyard in the heart of the palace, isn't it? Decorated with orange trees on either side to make it look even more beautiful. Splendid. Hundreds of candles all round the top. Look at them standing on the ledges inside the windows. It is truly, it was beautiful enough before, but now it's transformed into a nighttime spectacular. And look, here's an orchestra, so this is a musical performance. 
and they seem to be dancing on the stage. Oh, it says it's a ballet. That's right. And a ballet, uh, Alceste, a tragedy in music composed by Louis' own court composer, Jean-Baptiste Lully, one of the greatest musicians of his day. Only the very best for Louis. The king was at pains to make sure his guests didn't miss a single detail of his palace. One visitor gushed that the festivities astonished the spectators by their magnificence, novelty and pomp. Now this really is a scene, isn't it? A nighttime scene of fireworks and illuminations, the palace in the background, the fountains in the foreground. What do you think, Helen, was the point of this book of engravings? This is a big PR exercise. These are impressive pictures, even centuries later in black and white. But for the rest of Europe in 1664, this is how you do it. So Louis compiled all the engravings, gave them to ambassadors, who then take them home to their own European king or queen and say, look and learn. This is how they do it in France. This is the way to hold a party. And not just in France, but specifically at Versailles. Forget Paris, that was yesterday's news. Louis wanted the eyes of the world to be on the palace that he was building. Once Louis had captivated his courtiers with the entertainments of Versailles, he found other ways to keep them in full to him. To keep everybody in their places, Louis turned his life into a kind of public spectacle. Every minute of every day was filled with these weird rituals, some of them quite ridiculous, which all the courtiers had to follow, as if it were a religion. All the noblemen at court are required to present themselves at the appointed hour. Dukes before marquees, I believe. I'm with the Duke. Only a few, however, will be given the privilege of entering, observing, and in some cases, participating. Taking part in Louis' daily routines was a strictly controlled business. Only a chosen elite could share in his more intimate moments. The most important ceremony was the King's levee. his rising in the morning. It was as essential to life at Versailles as the rising of the sun. At eight o'clock sharp, the curtains of the state bed were drawn back to reveal the king. He may not have slept here, but he had to get back in time. And then he was greeted by his valet. Good morning. Next, in came the king's physician to check him over. His chamber pot was carried out, and this is really nice. In came the king's nurse that he'd had since he was a child to give him his good morning kiss. Then came the privileged few who had the right to attend what was known as the Grand Entrée. They were all high-born nobles, and they helped the king into his shirt. It sounds menial, but it was a huge honour. All you do is designed to be seen and admired. Dressing, shaving, drinking and eating. They are no longer actions, but a performance. Everything you do is a display of wealth, authority, harmony and modesty. And last but by no means least, piety. Louis thought of himself as a god, and now he was worshipped like one. Even the most powerful nobles were forced to bow and scrape. But observing Louis's strict daily routine could reap rewards. The clockwork timing of Louis' day meant the courtiers always knew exactly where the king was and what he was doing. And that meant they could engineer meetings with him, opportunities to ask for the favours that only the king could give. Like other monarchs, the king had the power to transform a courtier's fortunes. But Louis had his own special criteria for granting requests. As Louis progressed for mass, courtiers would line his route, pressing on either side, desperate for a word in the king's ear. If they succeeded in catching his attention, they might ask a favour for a friend. But if Louis thought that that particular nobleman hadn't spent enough time at Versailles, he'd turn the request down with the words, We never see him. I don't know him. It was as if that noble had never existed. The 
message was clear. Courtiers had better sharpen their elbows and fight their way to the front of the queue. If they wanted to get ahead in life, they had to put in the hours at Versailles. The nobles were now too busy vying for the king's attention to plot against him, and they weren't allowed to go back to their country seats where they could have fomented rebellion. It was all part of this strange cult of the Sun King. It's as if Louis used his magnetism to trap his nobles here in the gilded cage of Versailles. Now Louis could get on with enjoying the pleasures of life. And there was nothing he enjoyed more than the ladies. He pursued one beauty after another. Married and single, highborn and low. Not for nothing was his time in power known as the reign of love. Here are some of Louis's leading ladies. Now, kings of France often had two wives. One, uh, a wife for business. In Louis's case, it was Maria Theresa of Spain. It was her job to represent an alliance with another country and to give him his official children or heirs. But then he would have a wife for fun, a mistress, or in Louis's case, mistresses. At any one moment, the chief of them was called the maîtresse déclarée, the declared mistress. I think it's very French that she had a sort of semi-official job title. Louise de la Vallière was Louis's first maîtresse déclarée. The story of Louise de la Vallière is intertwined with the story of Versailles itself, because Louis was falling in love with her at the same time as he was falling in love with the idea of his palace. They held trysts there, and the magnificent party, the pleasures of the Enchanted Isle, was held to celebrate their love. Now, Louise's position as chief mistress was far from secure. The other ladies of the court all had their eye on Louis, and he was all too susceptible. When Louise came onto the scene, Louis was already having rather a scandalous relationship with Henriette of England. She was, wait for this, his brother's wife and his own first cousin. Gotcha. Spring is from. And there were plenty of other contenders vying for Louise de la Vallière's prized role of chief mistress. Enter Athenais de Montespan. Well, how many have you had? I do not call. Because why would one more make any difference? Hard to say without partaking. And why is that? Surely after a certain time it's just a number, is it not? That depends on the number. Athenaeus was devastatingly intelligent and confident and pretty and manipulative. She made friends with Louise in order to get close to their king. False friend. I am boring and you are funny. Perhaps in your turn, you might put him in a good mood for me. Don't him, make him laugh. If he's in a good humour, I might just have a chance. Would you do that? Because I could try. Now, Louis didn't stand a chance. He fell under the spell of Athenais. Very soon, he just had to make love to her three times a day. And he was so keen that he would start to undress her even before her ladies had left the room. And she was equally enthusiastic. It was said that her powder lit very easily. It wasn't long before Athenais usurped her so-called friend Louise and took her place at the top table. Athenais reigned supreme as official mistress for the next decade. And it was during this time that Louis fulfilled his dream of creating a palace. Not just fit for any old king, but fit for the Sun King. Now the gardens on this side will extend from here to here. Very good, sire. What is this large rectangle here? A lake. You wish to put a lake in this area? The area is the lake. That is... a big lake, yes. Sire, 
A lake that size would dwarf any structure that looks out upon it. That depends on the structure, does it not? Nothing could stand in the way of Louis's grand plans. He drained swamps, moved forests, and diverted rivers to make way for the world's most opulent royal playground. Its size and splendor trumpeted Louis's wealth and power. But a project worthy of such a prince required a workforce to match. The palace was under scaffolding for years at a time, and the gardens here looked pretty much like a quarry. Up to 36,000 people were slaving away here, and they were laboring under conditions you can only describe as horrendous. Builders toiled from dawn till dusk. A common bricklayer earned five sous a day, about the cost of a tiny piece of butter. Accidents were so frequent that three hospitals were built to deal with the casualties. And even in his exalted position, Louis could not quite escape the hardships that his workers endured. You say you are France. If you truly were, you'd know our suffering. You'd feel it in your bones. And you'd take the pain away. Builders went on strike in a bid to improve their lot. The grievances of many, sire. Many suffer from injuries sustained at their work that are as yet untreated. They claim that working conditions are too harsh, not enough attention is paid to their safety. Is this true? We lose half a dozen men per week, sire. Many more injured. From the archives, I dug out a document that gives a real-life example of Louis being brought face to face with the human cost of Versailles. In the summer of 1668, there was an accident involving some of the heavy machinery in use at Versailles. It's reported here in the Gazette of Amsterdam. We're told that there was an accident and some debris fell, and underneath it were caught five or six workmen, ouvriers, who were écrasés dessous. Écrasés, what does it? Crushed. Crushed. Crushed underneath. Crushed to death. Five or six of them. Five goodness. or six. And that's all we're told, one sentence at this point. But we get a little bit more detail a few days later, when the king was confronted by the mother of one of these poor dead workmen. She managed to get close enough to ask the king if she could have the body of her son back. The newspaper says, with many insults directed at the king, now whether that's exaggeration for journalistic effect or what the king felt had happened. Do you think it was quite shocking that she just got close enough and dared to speak to him? Absolutely, that someone of her status should be able to speak directly to the king himself in terms that were not complimentary. And it didn't go well for her. We're told that she was put in prison where she still is locked up, the newspaper says. So hang on, Louis' machine has crushed to death this woman's son. She has asked for his dead body. And for that, she's been put in prison. She has. The human cost of his great enterprises is irrelevant to Louis in comparison with his grand purposes. The question is, to what extent this is representative of something bigger, more characteristic of Louis's rule as a whole? Well, I guess you could say this is an absolute monarch doing his job. The needs of the state must come first. He has the power to override the trivial needs of the individual. But it does seem to me that there's something really cold and uniquely determined about Louis himself. I will not be pushed into the sea by a builder on a scaffold. Louis's determination and his ruthlessness made him many enemies. But he had ways of keeping one step ahead of anyone who might plot against him. You might think that surveillance is a modern concept, but Louis, who was insecure to the point of paranoia, kept a watchful eye on everyone. No one understood better than Louis that information was power. That is one of 948 journals gathered by our services detailing every single member of your court. Their height, weight, hair and eye color, their daily movements, from your valet to your cook's assistant, Madeleine Dubois. And Louis even knew everyone's innermost thoughts. How? because all mail to and from Versailles was intercepted. Historian James Daybell is guiding me through the lost world of 17th century espionage. This is so much more significant and atmospheric than licking the flap, isn't it? It is, it is. We really feel like this is a special thing to do. Now we're going to get our seal, which is a fleur-de-lis. Peel it away slowly. 
And there we are. That's not Very bad. Good. So if we got this letter in the post, you would know that I had sent it and that yes. it hadn't been tampered with. And it hadn't been tampered with, yes. Theoretically. So, so <laughs> it, it, it's secure. But at the Court of Versailles, we know that Louis' espionage masters were reading the letters. How did they do that when they were sealed up with wax? This is a dark art. We have an example of a letter from a courtier close to the king in which she warns a German cousin about this opening of letters. And she writes, just because letters are poorly sealed does not mean anything. They have a material made of mercury and other stuff that can be pressed onto the seal where it takes on the shape of the seal. After they've read and copied letters, they neatly resend them and no one can see that they have been opened. So that method involves making a replica of the original seal? Absolutely, and once you have that, you're then able to open and reseal people's correspondence all the time. That's pretty sneaky stuff. And James, what happened to the people whose mail was read then, contrary to their knowledge? Once he found that you were talking in a critical tone about his court, his policies, his friendships, you would be out of favour. And so many courtiers were destroyed in this way. This surveillance state that he develops in the 17th century is incredibly powerful and it's used to keep tabs on the courtiers at the very heart of his power base at Versailles. Disloyal courtiers wised up to Louis' tactics and found other ways to convey their messages. With all this surveillance going on, there's only one way to keep a secret. You had to write it in cipher. Secret. I have identified this as a Cistercian codex from the Low Countries. Very rare, almost forgotten. Used, it appears, as an alternative to Roman numerals. So these are merely numbers, which correspond to letters. But Louis beat the courtiers at their own game by employing cryptographers to crack the codes. The first message is very simple. Kill the men who bring this map. The second one is more intriguing. A riddle, in fact. The end is near. Make your peace with God. To make sure his own messages remain secret, Louis engaged the services of Antoine Rossignol. Rossignol was the greatest cryptographer of the 17th century. He came up with a code that was so complex that after it fell out of regular use, it baffled cryptographers for centuries. It was called the Great Cipher. All this secrecy sounds extreme, but it worked. After all, Louis wasn't assassinated. But the king's paranoia grew. In this world of fear and intrigue, who could he rely on? As so often, Louis didn't put his trust in the most powerful men in the land, potential rivals all, but those with whom he spent his most intimate hours, his chosen servants. And there was one servant who was forever by Louis's side, his valet for over 40 years, Alexander Bonton. Bonton was the first to see the king in the morning and the last to tuck him up in bed at night. He was one of the few people allowed to go through the gate in the golden balustrade into the king's private area of the bedchamber. Bonton himself slept just here on a camp bed. The first valet was the only person allowed to sleep in the king's bedchamber. Not even the queen could do that. Constantly vigilant, attentive to every need, he was like a faithful old hound. Sire, we received word that Parthenay family will arrive this morning. Will my daughter Charlotte be with them? Yes, sir. The great sunshine. Bonton's devotion to Louis dominated his life, almost to the exclusion of his own family. When asked one day how his wife was doing, he automatically replied, I'll ask the king. You have a woman? My wife lives in Paris. With you? I live with the king. Now I am confused. Wherever the king sleeps, I sleep. And this is as far as I go. His bed must be very crowded. Bonton knew everything about the king's most private affairs. All personal correspondence went through his hands, and he acted as a go-between for Louis and his lovers. It was said that Bonton was most secret. 
most faithful and entirely devoted to the king. This was one of Louis's closest relationships. Pull up a chair. I said a chair, not a stool. A chair with arms. Only a king may sit next to his majesty in the chair with arms. You are more than a king. You are my friend. So could Louis XIV and his trusty valet really have been friends? What do you think? Kings were surrounded by servants all the time. There was huge intimacy there. But real friendship? The difference in status made that much more complicated. It does seem, though, that Louis was more at ease with his retainers than almost anyone else. Ah, and there is the evidence of the Duke of Saint-Simon, who says that the king loved his servants more than his own children. In return for his devoted service, Louis showered Bonton with gifts of land, titles and lucrative posts. Bonton could even afford a townhouse in Paris with his own staff of 12. Louis didn't just elevate his personal servants, he made a point of promoting ministers from more humble backgrounds. And his decision to promote them at the expense of his nobles brought about a change in the way that France was governed. It began what the resentful Saint-Simon called the reign of the vile bourgeoisie. Louis transformed life at court down to the smallest detail. He even changed what people wore, from the hats on their heads to the shoes on their feet. Louis's own love of drama and splendour was reflected in his wardrobe. This was power dressing, Louis XIV style. I must tell you all, I believe that very soon we shall have a revolution in our country. The world knows France to be a master of the battlefield. But one glimpse around this glorious place will tell you. Soon it will be our textile mercers and our master tailors who shall transform the world. Our fashions will be revered just as much for their beauty, elegance, refinement and grace. The finest in the world. To achieve his ends, Louis introduced a strict new dress code. We are trying it on the side with the help of costume historian Mark Wallace. How did Louis make his courtiers look the way that he wanted them to? By the royal edict, you could not wear anything not made of French manufacture. So if you were caught wearing something made from a different country, it would be taken off and burnt. And fined, of course, too. He did something that never had happened before, which was to invent a court uniform called the Juste Corps à Brevé. Now, these coats are entirely new, made of blue cloth, covered in gold and silver, lined with red. Only 50 men, the king, the royal dukes, the princes, etc., were allowed to wear this coat. That really showed you were in with the in crowd. And if you died, your coat would be handed on to the next person considered suitable enough to wear it. So he's using the carrot and the stick. They want to look like they're part of the club. They want to look good. And if they break the rules, they get fined. Yes. And of course, it suited Louis' ego. The more splendid his court looked, the better he looked, and was the envy of all Christian princes. Thanks to Louis, France became the capital of haute couture, something it's remained to this day. And Louis found that forcing his courtiers to follow fashion had other advantages. So how much of an investment would an outfit like this have been? So you have around your, your colour is Bertha, as it's known. This would be the equivalent around your shoulders of perhaps a very expensive sports car, perhaps even a yacht. You also have lace upon your gown, down the front and all around the hem of the skirt. Again, just to show your wealth or your husband's wealth and your extravagance. Now turning to Lucy, again with your coat made of silk. And of course the gold galloon running down the front vertically on your coat. A wonderful detail. Lots of buttons made in France of gold. So really everything is the best. Yet you've got to afford not just one outfit. You had to have lots of different outfits for lots of different occasions. All of which cost a fortune. This one is nice. We need more than just a dress. A filigree bracelet and a necklace of diamonds, believe me. But how are we paying? me worry about that. What happened if they couldn't afford it? It was so expensive, you wouldn't bankrupt people. So you borrow from the king at a certain interest level, and that gets you deeper in. You're in a royal circle of debt, aren't you? It's incredible how we managed it, like the spider in the great golden web. 
It was typically clever of Louis to use fashion to show off his courtiers' wealth, while at the same time stripping it away from them. As one Marquis said, no one at Versailles was really rich because they'd spent their fortunes on all this. The ruthless side of Louis's nature was also evident in his treatment of his closest relative, his brother, Philippe. Now do it to me, I knew it. The minute you hit the chance, you belittle me again. Brother, the magic word, what is it? Do not forget who addresses you. You never were good at sharing. Throughout history, the relationship between a king and his younger brother has been tricky. It's no fun being the spare when you want to be the heir. And the relationship between Louis and his younger brother was understandably tense. It is hard to be a king. Try being a king's brother for a day. The differences between Louis and Philippe were clear from very early on. Here's Louis as a little boy, and he's already dressed as a little king in his beautiful leather boots, his red breeches with gold fringing, his hat with the white plume. And at first glance, you might assume that this is his sister. It looks like a girl with pink cheeks and wearing a dress. But actually, it's Louis's younger brother, Philippe. Now, don't read too much into this. Little boys in the 17th century were put in dresses until they were old enough to be breeched, at the age of seven, put into a man's clothing or breeches. But in this case, the boy's mother was determined that Philippe should never present a threat to Louis. To this end, she nurtured his feminine side. She called him my little girl, and she always encouraged him to wear dresses. This had a lasting impact on Philippe. Philippe du Gorléon. As an adult, Philippe sometimes chose to dress up as a woman, and he loved ladies' clothing. One court chronicler said that he was always decked out like a woman, covered everywhere with rings, bracelets and jewels with a long black wig. He also wore such high heels that he looked like he was wearing stilts. So good of you to come. Pleasure. He spent 50,000 on shoes. Well... You haven't seen the shoes. Madame de Lafayette said that the miracle of inflaming the heart of this prince was not reserved for any woman. Philippe was married to Henriette of England, but his true love was the Chevalier de Lorraine, a handsome, blonde-haired nobleman of princely rank. He lived with Philippe and was a sort of male official mistress. It was a crowded marriage. Philippe flaunted his femininity. Everybody knew that he had male lovers. On the one hand, this was an embarrassment to Louis, and on the other, it meant that Philippe served as a foil to the king. They were two halves of a whole, a perfect double act. Philippe's lack of manliness only served to emphasize Louis's masculinity. But, as it turned out, and perhaps surprisingly for a man who loved shoes so much, Philippe would upstage his brother in one crucial area. Philippe dreamed of being a soldier. In the 1670s, when France was at war with Holland, he demanded to join the action. On top. I have a sword, armor and a horse. Why the delay? When will I go to war? The king has not yet set a date. What am I supposed to do until then? In the spring of 1677, the French launched a rapid attack on enemy-held towns in northern France. Philippe was finally posted to the front line. At the Battle of Cassel, he commanded the troops and personally led the charge. said that he charged like a grenadier. Philippe fought so bravely that his troops were inspired to perform miracles. The result? A complete
complete victory against the Dutch. Afterwards, on the road back to Paris, people shouted, Long live the king and monsieur who won the battle. Louis didn't like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs>